This video was brought to you by GKids and viewers like you. Thank you. Idol culture is one of those weird, specific parts of Japan as a whole that we, in the West, don't have a proper comparison for. An idol is a young girl who gets glitzed and glamoured up to sing and perform for audiences. To be a star that comes from nowhere in order to entertain and inspire us all, but perhaps just as quickly to also fade away into obscurity. The closest thing that we possibly have over here is the celebrity culture with Hollywood, but even then, Hollywood has lost its luster of being that place for anyone. A place where a person with, with no money in their pocket, but a dream in their heart, can travel to and seek their fortune. Idols in Japan are still going strong. Maybe not as strong as they were in the 80s, but you know, times change. For many young girls, becoming a pop idol is a dream. One that some are lucky enough to see fulfilled. It's a dream of inspiring hundreds or thousands of others through their performances to briefly escape their dreary lives and live in the moment. To create a passionate following of fans excited to see them, even if their lives off stage are less glamorous than they would have hoped. Perfect Blue is about one such woman. However, this is not a story about a dream but instead a nightmare. One that now, finally, in 2019, we can experience on Blu-ray in all of its HD glory. And so, ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection, where today we are taking a look at Satoshi Kon's psychological masterpiece, Perfect Blue. Let's jam. Get down! To start off my attempt to talk about this film, a bit of context should be given about the show's director. Satoshi Kon, who unfortunately passed away back in 2010, is a well-respected director and has been credited by some as a kind of visionary. The work that he has produced on his own hit a very different kind of beat from the norm, and he developed a mastery over a very specific kind of storytelling and animation mix that resulted in projects far ahead of their time. This all built up his experience and profile until 1997 when, in collaboration with the animators at Madhouse, he released his first feature-length film, Perfect Blue. Perfect Blue is a film based on the novel of the same name, by Yoshikazu Takuchi, and it tells the tale of an established pop idol named Minma. Due to wanting to develop her skills and profile under the urging of one of her managers, she decides to leave the singing spotlight that being a pop idol gives her and starts to make the transition into being a professional actress. She does photo shoots for magazines and soon lands a small role on a murder mystery series for television. Unfortunately, idol culture is something that follows you wherever you go. Something that you can never truly get away from. So when people associated with Mima end up murdered, it's clear that a former fan is just a little too upset that his favorite idol is no longer in the same spotlight that she once was. If we left the summary of the film at that, it would probably still make for a very good story, but narratives by Satoshi Kon are hardly ever that simple and direct. Mima throughout the film is constantly conflicted with her professional decisions. She believes that her choices are the right ones, but still doesn't feel excited by the change. She seems disappointed at the start and just looks to be going along with it because that's what's expected of her. This is not surprising considering that historically, idols have had very little control over their lives. Their entire outfacing personas are carefully cultivated by agencies and corporations for various purposes. And with the commonplace of finding new idols out of nowhere who have no prior experience in the music or entertainment industries, 
idols are also quite replaceable, which puts further pressure on existing idols to succeed or be tossed aside. The changes made to Mima's professional life also keeps moving into situations far darker than she might have originally bargained for. The television series she got a role for, it eventually writes her character into having a scene where she gets assaulted at a club. That promotional piece for a magazine, well, wouldn't you know it, but they rather like using nudity in their photo spreads. All the while, she starts to hallucinate, seeing her former idol self talking to her, berating her, asking her if this is what she wanted. She keeps losing consciousness during the day, waking up in her apartment and wondering how she got there. She sees photos of herself posted to a fan site that she doesn't remember being taken. Who was that girl? Was it really her, or is the pop idol version of herself taking over? Going back to that murder mystery series she's involved with, what if I told you that its own story beats almost mirror that of Mima's current situation, leading us, the audience, to wonder if what's happening before us is actually real, or just a recreation of that show's story within Mima's own mind? This is all displayed in a pretty masterful way through editing and scene changes. Khan has a habit of transitioning scenes with matching shots, like for example showing Mima in a stressful situation near a dead body, only to fade and have her performing in front of a studio audience. Which scene is the real one? Did they both happen? Did neither? Perfect Blue is almost a textbook example of the unreliable narrator trope put to film. An unreliable narrator is when the story or perspective is told by a character whose credibility is in some way compromised, and so you cannot trust their perspective or any information from the very character that is supposed to guide you through this narrative. In this case, the story almost exclusively follows Mima around, but when she starts questioning what is real, we have to do the very same. We cannot believe anything that is shown to us throughout the film for what Mima sees or doesn't see may not have actually happened. Did she buy those clothes from the department store? She doesn't remember it, but they appeared in her closet. Did she really see herself in that passing car? Are there two of her, or is it just a hallucination? Did she really kill that man, as depicted in one of the film's own posters? None of this could have happened, and yet all of it might have. That is the kind of brilliance of this film in many ways, because it was one of the first to make you truly question what is real and what is an illusion. Another aspect that Perfect Blue nails is how it depicts a character potentially living a double life. Kohn furthers on this concept with both of his later films, Millennium Actress and Paprika, but in Perfect Blue, it starts with this clash between Mima's private life and that of her public persona. Most of what we see is through the eyes of her personal life and what she views, same as what you or I might see if we were in her shoes, but her public persona, the persona of the idol, has its own personality, its own way of doing things. It is its own character separate from Mima herself that the audience has to decide if it's real, a figment of her imagination under stress, or, knowing Khan, a metaphysical being manifested through the emotional turmoil of both Mima and those who idolize her. As I mentioned, these, these are the things that Satoshi Kon has played with since. Many of the same narrative tropes are expanded upon later in his more recent works, albeit in slightly different ways. Of all of them though, Perfect Blue was really the rawest example of this storytelling which is what still makes it remarkable to view even this many years since the film's original debut. Now, of course, there are some <laughs> dated aspects to this film. Having to watch someone explain to Mima what the internet is and how to use a computer that has a CRT monitor shows almost the exact age of this film. And that's a bit funny to watch, admittedly. But despite this, the film can also still be extremely relevant to present day viewers. I'd almost like to say that the film could come off as being even more relatable to general audiences now than it did back in the 90s, what with the modern influence of social media on the lives of the public. It's interesting 
just how much easier it is now to have a person be able to reach the same sort of fame and audience today as the Japanese idols of the 80s and 90s, just for a different medium. Instead of pop stars, we have the stars of Instagram and YouTube. The, the troubles of cultivating a fan base on places like Twitch, and even watching those communities spiral out of control when the personalities behind them decide that they want to change. Back in the 90s, obsessive fans and their stalker tendencies as displayed in this film were very relevant to the time. But even today, the idea of tracking one of your idols down and following their every move has been made all the easier just 20 years later. There's even the argument to be made that a person's online persona is very different from how that person is in real life, similar to Mima's private and public personas. There are so many different avenues of discussion and depth to this story, this narrative, that have and still can be explored, with many more avenues still to come, I hope. This is not a film that will suit everyone tastes, similar to how you can't always get someone to enjoy something like Monster or Devilman Crybaby. It's an early example of a film that you just don't recommend to someone to watch with the lights off. Unless you are a really horrible friend, you know who you are. But for the 83 minutes of this film's running time, this is a story and an experience that will make you forget your surroundings entirely and become totally immersed in it. Perfect Blue is an amazing and unique animated thriller, simply because it's one of the few truly good thrillers to come out of an animated studio. It joined a superb lineup of anime films from the 90s that really did show just how different and, well, adult animation can be. In an age when people today see adult-centered animation as something that needs to be comedic in order to succeed, Perfect Blue is the reminder that we need that animation can be anything we want it to be. It's a concept that's both invigorating and downright frightening. Thank you for spending the time to watch my thoughts on Perfect Blue. I hope you enjoyed it. While the film isn't currently available for streaming, as is the unfortunate case with all too many anime films, you can, however, order the DVD and, more importantly, the Blu-ray online as it is available from the American distributor G-Kids, who are also very nice and are sponsoring this very video. For alternate anime recommendations, however, it is very difficult, very difficult to come up with similar anime that have the same tone or even the same kind of feel and impact that Perfect Blue has. The easy recommendation would just simply be to go watch anything else that Satoshi Kon has ever been involved with. But barring that, however, my first recommendation actually comes from another legendary director, this time Masaki Yuasa and his 2004 film Mind Game. This film is a trip. If you've ever seen Yuasa's work before, like say Devilman Crybaby, you'll know that it tends to occasionally dip into the abstract and just have an animation style that is wholly unique. I really do need to get around to making a video about Yuasa's work as a whole, but until then, I leave you with that recommendation as it is one of my favorite films of his, and it will almost literally blow your mind. My second recommendation is not for an individual film, but rather an entire film series. Kata no Kyokai, The Garden of Sinners. I am not bold enough to say that Sinners took any cues from Kon's work, but there are a lot of elements that are in a similar vein. But while Perfect Blue and Kon's work as a whole focus a lot more on a, a realistic perspective on things, Sinners is far more fantastical and epic in scale, which adds a nice flavor. Among these options, I hope you find something to your liking. Lastly, I want to give a very special thank you to my patrons, who not only support my work in general, but who also allow me to do what I do. I love and appreciate you all. Specifically, though, as I like to do, I want to give particular shout-outs to patrons Joshua Garcia, Calhoun Boy, Siri Yamako, Rifen Bonaparte, and Rune Jacobson for being especially awesome. You guys are great. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime and stay frosty.